We're in the book of Titus. We're doing a short series uh, in the book of Titus. Just a reminder, uh, Paul left Titus, one of his uh, uh, young men, one of the young men he was uh, mentoring and bringing along, he left him on the island of Crete. <laughs> and in the reading today, we're going to be looking, we're in chapter 1, the 10 through 16. Uh, there's this quote from one of the people of Crete. Uh, he said, the people of Crete are all liars, cruel animals, and lazy gluttons. Of course, since he was from Crete, we don't know if that's true or not, because all from Crete are liars. So it's, there's a little con conundrum there. Um, how many of you know the story of uh, Little Red Riding Hood? Is that, is that known in most places in the world? Little Red Riding Hood. Little, little, I can't say it. Little Red Riding Hood. Uh, the story uh, in its original form is quite gruesome. <laughs> I, I, I'm glad that we kind of changed it. I don't know how we got all of these fairy tales uh, that were so uh, gruesome in nature. The story is of a little girl going to her grandmother's house to bring uh, a snack or something to her, but the wolf gets there first. And in the original, the wolf eats the grandma and gets in her clothing and gets in her bed. And when Little Red Riding Hood comes in, um, she begins to notice something's wrong. <laughs> and she said, oh, Grandma, what a deep voice you have. And uh, the Grandma makes some excuse about it. And she says, oh, Grandma, what, what great large eyes you have. And she said, oh, the better to see you, my dear. And eventually, she gets to the point in saying, oh, Grandma, what big teeth you have. And uh, the wolf jumps out and eats her in the original, OK? So it's kind of a gruesome uh, story. Uh, we've kind of cleaned it up. We have a woodman that comes and kills the wolf, and we find Grandma is only locked in the closet. So that's the, that's the sanitized version of it. But the idea of a wolf in sheep's clothing does not come from fairy tales. Actually, it comes from the scriptures. Jesus warned us about wolves uh, that... Uh, those who are false prophets. Let me read you Matthew 7, 15. Behold the false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but they're really vicious wolves. In Matthew 10, 16, he says, Look, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. So be shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. Paul picked up the words of Jesus, and in 2 Corinthians, he warned the people, These people are false apostles. They are deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. But I'm not surprised, even Satan disguised himself as an angel of light. And so it's no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. In the end, uh, they will get the punishment their wickedness, wicked deeds deserve. Peter said this to as he wrote to all the churches in his letter in his second letter uh, but there were also false prophets in israel just as there are false teachers among you and they will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who brought them uh, in, in this way they will bring sudden destruction on themselves now we've all dressed up at one time or another uh, here in Germany, it's at Fasching time. You put on a costume. In America, it's Halloween that's just passed. And as a little kid, it was it was always kind of fun to dress up to be a pirate or a cowboy or uh, uh, a hobo. That was the cheapest one. I could wear old clothes and put dirt on my face. You know, carry a stick, hobo. Um, and and kids loved it. Back in my day, it was pretty safe to go out. I'm not sure I let kids out these days uh, doing it, um, but when it's just for fun, there's no harm in it. But these, that Titus, uh, that Paul is talking about with Titus, it's not just for fun. These are pretending to be followers of Christ, but they are false prophets. Let me read for you then uh, verses 10 through 16 of chapter 1 of Titus. For there are many rebellious people who engage in useless talk and deceive others. This is especially true of those who insist on circumcision for salvation. 
They must be silenced because they are turning whole families away from the truth by their false teaching. They do it only for money. Even one of their own men, a prophet from Crete, has said, the people of Crete are all liars, cruel animals, lazy gluttons. This is true. So reprimand them sternly to make them strong in the faith. They must stop listening to Jewish myths and commands of people who have turned away from the truth. Everything is pure to those whose hearts are pure, but nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving because their minds and consciences are corrupt. Such people claim to know God, but they deny him by the way they live. They are detestable, disobedient, worthless for doing anything good. Reading through the end of chapter one. And here he, he gives us three major topics. One is that we need to rebuke false teachers. Secondly, that we need to rescue deceived believers. And thirdly, that we need to recognize uh, the corrupt teachings. And, and so he gives uh, Titus these, these words so that we can understand. First of all, uh, he identifies uh, the manner of false teachers. The very first thing he says is there are many rebellious people who engage in useless talk. The, the key factor uh, of, a, of a false teacher is he's rebelling against the truth. He knows the truth, but he denies it. If he's not deceived. He's saying these are not deceived people. These are rebellious people. And they present useless talk or vain or empty talk, and they try to deceive or seduce uh, those who are listening to them. Then he gives us the motive. Uh, the motive was always selfish, always selfish. Uh, those who teach false doctrine always are trying to bring attention to themselves or uh, pleasure to themselves, monetary gain. He points it out. Uh, they're only doing it for money. Down through the history of the church, unfortunately, uh, their number has been multiplied over and over again. Uh, I remember uh, reading about, uh, you know, when television came out and, and television evangelists came sliding around. Uh, and they would ask, please send money. And then it would come out that these men were flying around in private jets, living in Fancy homes, staying in the best suites. Uh, one of the interpreters in Russia said that there was a teacher came and she insisted on staying in the presidential suite of the most expensive hotel in Moscow. Uh, that was, she had to have that. Uh, and, and so one of the things that we can note is that if these leaders, and usually it's a very charismatic type person, the one that draws people to them, uh, if they're doing it for monetary gain, you can mark it down. So they're false teachers. And then look at the methods. The methods are really important for we need to understand how are false teachers doing? How are they deceiving people? First thing is, they detract from the salvation of grace. Notice it says that uh, they are uh, especially true of those who insist on circumcision for salvation. Now, I don't think we have any false prophets running around now insisting that, but we have many who are insisting that you add something to uh, the grace of God. So you, you can be saved if the, if the grace of God plus you do this, plus you do that. Uh, legalism, setting a strict set of rules. Uh, in, in times past, uh, that was much more prevalent within the church. Every church had these rules and these rules and these rules. Today, we've almost swung to the other side and we have licentiousness that we do whatever you want. It doesn't matter what you do. And uh, there's a quote on your sheet. Uh, legalism and licentiousness are not at opposite ends of the spectrum with grace as a balance point in the middle, uh, as is often taught. Rather, legalism and licentiousness are the flip side of the same coin. Both are rooted in the flesh 
and uh-huh. neither produce true godliness. <laughs> So it's not like uh, you can you can somehow balance in the middle. That's not the tr- it is the truth, or it is a distortion of the truth. And it's if you add anything to salvation, uh, or take anything away from the commands of God, you're distorting the truth. There, notice he says that they focus on myths, not on works of Christ. If you look at the history of uh, cultic movements, movements that have gone away from the the orthodox Christian faith, uh, they are often based upon a dream that someone had, or a vision, or an angel spoke to them. Uh, The word of God is not enough for these people. Uh, They add these myths, and they take away from the works of Christ. We don't need an angel to come and talk to us Uh, about how uh, to know about Jesus Christ. We have the word of God. We don't need uh, to have some kind of new vision. Uh, God is working through his word and through his people today. Uh, 1 Timothy 1.4 says, Don't let them waste their time in endless discussion of myths and spiritual pedigrees. These things only lead to meaningless speculation which don't help people live a life of faith in God. And then thirdly, as a method, they promote man's commandments and not God's. Man's commandments and not God's. Jesus ran into this when he was on the earth. There were those that said, wait a minute, you don't wash your hands correctly. You're not following the rituals of, of, the, of the church. You're not uh, doing the things that, uh, that we believe that you should do. The Pharisees were great. And making rules. They had 39 rules and 39 sub rules under every of the, one of the 39 rules. And Jesus spoke to them in Mark chapter 7. He said this uh, For you ignore God's laws and substitute your own traditions. Then he said, You skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold on to your own traditions. And then one of the things he pointed out to them, one of their traditions, was that they could not care for their own parents if they said this money that we have or these possessions, they, we call them Corbin. They belong to God. Now, they didn't give them to God. They kept them. Uh, but by calling them Corbin, they could not use them to help their own parents in need. And that was one of the things that Jesus pointed out. And today, uh, we have people that want us to follow man's commandments and not Christ's commandments. Uh, we have people that are promoting religion and not a relationship with Christ. So we need to speak out of the truth. He says rebuke. He said they should be silenced. Uh, but also, look at this, this one verse that it really seems to be kind of turned around. This is true. So he's talking about the, the Crete uh, that were always liars. So reprimand them sternly to make them strong in the faith. Reprimand them to make them strong in the faith. So he was saying to Titus, don't just rebuke those who are teaching false things. Save those who are being deceived by these such teachings. And notice he mentions, because they are turning whole families away. Um, Today we live in in an age uh, when the family is under attack. Uh, in, in my growing up days, uh, I know you, you're convinced I'm still young, but I'm not. <laughs> um, but in my growing up days, uh, television shows in America made fun of families. They, you know, <laughs> Father Knows Best uh, was the name of a television program, and Father was a dope. <laughs> uh, and in lots of the movies, the father or a... a Normal family were considered silly, and they made fun of them. Today, it's much more uh, outward uh, attacks on the family, and we are having people uh, saying, oh, we don't know what family really is. It could be three people, it could be four people, uh, it could be same gender people, it could be uh, people who are uh, not sure what gender they are. Uh, We have leaders of nations who say, I don't know what a woman is. How how can this be? 
Uh, God made it very clear in the beginning. Uh, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That is the marriage formula. It's given back in Genesis. Uh, uh, then Jesus, when he was asked about, well, should, is it okay just to divorce for any reason? Jesus said, haven't you read the scriptures? God made them men and women, and God said, uh, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then Paul, teaching the, to the church, uh, said, I want you to understand, this is a mystery, but this is like Christ loving his church. But he again quotes this, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, the bonding of, of love together, and the two shall become one flesh. And that's the order that God gives uh, for the family. And there's no other order given. When we start changing that, we start destroying uh, families. We start pulling people away. But he's saying, remind them of this, reprimand them so that they will be strong in their faith. And the word here, strong, is sound. That which we mentioned last week, uh, it is not mixed with false teaching. Sound doctrine is strong. Found, founded upon the word of God. Ephesians 5.11 says this, Take no part in worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. We are we're to make it known. Jude, Jude 22 and 23 says, You must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that can contaminate their lives so uh, what we are to do is to help those who are struggling people say well I, I don't know what is true I don't know what is what is right we are to direct them to God's word and uh, we are promised by Jesus that when he sent the Holy Spirit into the world the spirit of truth that he would guide us into all truth so the last portion, the last two verses here, he talks about, well, how do we recognize corrupt teachings? Now, I want to give you just a few signs uh, that you can be sure that, that this is not true teaching of Christianity. Uh, it's a cult. One is when they claim to be the only ones. If there's a group that says, well, we're the only one with the truth. Well, no other groups are right. We have the only truth. You can, you can run up a red flag. That, that's not a Christian uh, group. They, have, uh, they are exclusive. They have closed membership. Uh, they control. They want to control what you think. They want to control who you uh, associate with. They want to control how you dress. They want to control uh, everything about your life. That's a sign of a call. Uh, and they use intimidation. Uh, one of the major cults in America is in, in the joining of that organization, you pronounce a curse upon yourself if you ever leave. That's part of, part of the ritual of joining uh, that. But here, Paul mentions to Titus two tests that, they should, that he should look for. First of all, the test of their conscience, a purity of mind, to be pure, uh, means that our hearts have been cleansed. Not because we are so good, not because we have done great things, but because of God's love for us, we are cleansed. It says uh, it, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, we are to walk righteous, in righteousness before the Lord. And you say, well, I, I, I don't think I can do that, nor can I in my own strength. We only can do that as God helps us. Uh, those purified in heart by faith, they, they can handle all things. He gives an example, or we pick up an example uh, in Romans. It says, don't tear apart the works of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable, but it's wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. You see, the, the, the challenge becomes not the thing itself, but the motivation and, and the lack of love. 
if, if I uh, do that before this other person. Now, um, maybe I'll get in trouble with some people here, but I'm gonna give you a, a, a concrete example. I do not drink alcohol. It's not because I don't, that I think alcohol makes you unsaved, okay? It's not a salvation issue. The reason I don't drink alcohol is because I know some people cannot control alcohol. And, and out of love for them, I just soon abstain and, and step back. That, everybody has to make their own decision about that. But there are people who cannot control it, and so I just want to step back. Um, it is not what we eat or drink, Jesus said, that defiles us. Uh, in Matthew 15, he says, from the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. These are what defile you. Eating with unwashed hands will never defile you. Uh, he was being persecuted by those who said you didn't do it right. Uh, sin alone touches and defiles the soul. So the first uh, test is, is their conscience clear? Are they, are they doing this out of love? Are they serving and teaching out of a love and a concern for others? Secondly, their conduct. He said... Uh, there, there's no integrity in their actions. Look what he says. They say or they claim to know God. But what they do and what they do, they deny him and what they do. In 1 John 2, 4, it says, If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commands, that person's a liar and is not living the truth. Uh, also in 1 John number of places he talks about if I say I love God but I hate my neighbor or my brother or any race or any group of people I, I'm a liar I, I can't love God and hate other people I can hate what some people do I, I do hate what some people do because of the damage that it does to others but if I say I love God and I hate others I do not pass the test. He says such people are detestable, disobedient, and worthless. And that's a, that's a nice translation. Uh, actually, that first word says they stink. <laughs> they are smelly people. So what, what should we do? Uh, you know, there's all these false teachings. There's all these new teachings around us. How do we know the truth? How can we know the truth? I want to give you three simple steps. Number one, don't panic. <laughs> don't panic. God will not let you be deceived unless you refuse the truth. If you see people who are caught up uh, in, in false teachings and, and they're working their heart away uh, in, in something wrong that doesn't line up with the word of God, you can mark it down somewhere in their life they refuse to believe the truth. Listen to what uh, Paul says to the Thessalonians. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. It used to puzzle me when I would see workers in certain cults, certain uh, sects that were totally away from Christianity, uh, these people would work endlessly, tirelessly trying to promote uh, their own uh, group. And I thought, wow, I can't get Christians even to uh, show up on prayer night. How, what's going on here? And uh, I, I, then I found this scripture. I began to think about it. Because they refuse to believe the truth, God allows them to believe a lie. If you come up against uh, the truth about God's love for you and, and about how he has provided for your salvation in Jesus Christ by grace alone, if you refuse that, in Hebrews it says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? God loved us so much that he sent his own son to die in our place. If we reject that truth, God will allow us to believe a lie. And we will be condemned because 
We have refused to believe the truth. So don't panic unless you're re refusing to believe. Uh, it, it, God is okay with doubters, okay? As long as they're seeking the truth. Uh, even Thomas, uh, after the resurrection, uh, Thomas said, I, I won't believe unless I see his hands and I put my uh, hand in his side. And when Jesus showed up, he didn't say, Thomas, what is wrong with you? He said, Thomas, come over here and look. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Jesus did not correct him. Jesus was fully God. And he said, because you see and believe, uh, you're, you're blessed. Blessed are those who don't see and believe. We've lived 2,000 years now. The gospel has been passed down. The Bible has been protected uh, miraculously. Uh, the translations that have tried to destroy it, the uh, dictators that tried to burn it, uh, it still is here because it's God's word. If we refuse that truth, then we're in trouble. But we have the Holy Spirit to guide us in the truth. Secondly, Focus on the truth about Christ, not on other groups. I, I really want to warn you in this area. Don't get too uh, curious about other groups and begin to look at them. Before the age of, of machines that made uh, sure that a, 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 a bill, a, a dollar or a Euro bill was correct. Now we run them through little machines and the machine says this is authentic or not. Before that, people had to be trained how to tell counterfeit money. And do you know how they did it? They didn't tell them all the variations. They gave them an authentic dollar bill, $100 bill, whatever. And they laid it before them and they said, study it and continue to study it. And if you focus on it long enough and you look at then at one that was counterfeit, you would immediately see the difference. Focus on Jesus. Focus on him. Every false cult, cult from the first century onward has erred on the person and work of Christ. There are those who said he is, uh, he's God, but he's not truly human. There are others that insisted that he was human, but he wasn't truly God. Others said that he was some kind of a hybrid, a, a created being somehow in between. Many have said that he's a great teacher or example, uh, but they have denied the necessity of his shed blood. Here's the truth. The truth is he is either a liar because he, he claimed to be the son of God, claimed to be uh, the, the one true God that came to the earth, the Messiah. And some people say, oh, Jesus didn't really say that. Yes, he did. He not only said it, the Jews understood it. They took up stones. They were going to stone him to death. They understood what he was saying. So he's either a liar uh, or he's a lunatic that he just thought. You know, if you go to mental institutes, you'll find some people there who say, I, I'm Jesus. Uh, and they, they're, they're totally irrational. Or he's the Lord. You don't have other choices. You can't say he's a good teacher. If he's a good teacher, he wouldn't say he was God. And he wouldn't proclaim that by faith in his name we can be saved. A good teacher wouldn't do that. Uh, so he's either a liar, a lord, a, a lunatic, or he's the Lord. Hebrews 12, 2 says this. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and now he's seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And when your eyes are upon him and, and the truth about him, then you, when you come in contact with false teaching, you will immediately recognize it. That, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what God has revealed about Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, trust the Holy Spirit to lead you into truth. The spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. Uh, when Jesus left this earth, he said to his disciples, it's good for you that I'm going away. 
And I'm sure that they, if they were taking a vote at that point, they would have voted like, no, we do not want you to go away. And you're going to leave us alone. He said, it's good for you to go because if I go, the Holy Spirit will come and indwell you. Jesus, if he were alive today, could only be in one place at one time. But the Holy Spirit can dwell in every believer. As we yield our life to God and ask him to uh, forgive our sins and to change our life, uh, then God comes in and the Holy Spirit comes in and he becomes our guide and directs us. And when he directs us, we need to listen. We need to understand that he will guide us into truth and into obedience of God's, uh, of God's path. We are in danger today. There are false teachings within the church of Jesus Christ. Even mainline denominations are getting confused about uh, things that the Bible clearly talks about. The Bible clearly uh, explains the truth about marriage, about uh, sexuality. It is clear in the Bible. It's not some fuzzy thing. It's very clear there. And we have groups that are weighing out on this side or weighing out on that side about it. God uh, will guide you into the truth if you focus on the truth and not upon the myths that you're hearing about him. Let me pray for you real quickly and I'm going to turn it back over. We have another song. Uh, we're going to count how many boxes we have here. I think I think uh, I saw Alex sneaking over there to count those already. <laughs> but how many did you count? 72 plus the ones coming, so 79, I think. 79. Woo! So we, we went over our 75, all right? Uh, Geraldine up in, uh, in uh, Regensburg, she wrote me a note and said, count my, count me up for three also. I have three more for you. So when we get it all counted up, I think we'll be close to 100. So that will be fun. That will be fun. Let me pray for us. Father, you know how easily we are deceived. And we pray that you will guide us in the truth. That you will help us to encourage one another in the word of God and in the truth so that we might strengthen our faith in Christ. I pray, Father, that uh, you would help us to stay true to your word and true to your spirit in Jesus' precious name.